Uh, before we go back to the boys club, Monica, I would like you to play that soundbite you have when I think it was about a year ago, August 2018, when Bob just came back from surgery in the UK or from treatment. And this is what he had to say right here on the bench. Take a listen. I had been feeling unwell for a while. Uh, you know, Caprona Catoni came to see me when I was in London, and he says, we just thought you were getting boring. <laughs> I said, Kip, he said, because, you know, you're skipping, you know, functions in the evening yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So I was feeling tired. Um, I was running temperatures from time to time, but the temperatures didn't last very long. So it'll last like 24 hours and then I'd be okay. Um, uh, when I was finally diagnosed in London, he said, you probably had this thing for about six months. So that takes me back to the first, the first symptoms I saw when I was in Morocco, uh, I went to, to something there. And um, I had this kind of flu -y thing. I noticed, um, a strange thing, I noticed a pain in, my, in the bones of my shin, which is not something you, you experience unless you kick something hard. And so eventually I was in Chamonix and I had the shakes, you know, I was really like this one evening. And um, my wife on boy said, I think you've got malaria because she's really, really good at self-diagnosis. Um, so she called her mom. I know I'm going to get into serious trouble when I get home tonight. She called her mom and yeah. her mom said, yeah, it's probably malaria. Go get some, some medications. And, um, but anyway, and, you know, I finally went to a doctor back here in Nairobi who, um, who said, I think you're vitamin D deficient. Here's some supplements. I said, Look, okay, um, let me go see a proper doctor. <laughs> so I went to, um, to Dr. Silverstein at uh, mm. Nairobi, and he ran a series of tests. He said, because I don't know. So he did about 30, I remember the number now, 30 different blood tests. I know that because it cost me $1,000 uh, just for the test, and I had to pay there. You know what, Nairobi? Yeah, 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 you're right. And he said, look, I, um, I don't know what the problem is, but I need some more tests, so I need to admit you as soon as I can. It's actually the first time I'd ever been admitted in hospital. And so I went in on the Monday and uh, he said, I need to do a bone marrow aspirate. I didn't know what that was. I said, sure. I said, it sounds painful. He said, that'd be fine. And so they actually take some bone marrow out and they test it. And he said, okay, so I think um, you have a problem with your blood. Um, I'm not the expert on the subject. Um, so I want to refer you to an expert, but I need to get you out of here pretty soon. And I said, well, Sure. I mean, you know, I've got the, uh, the elections are coming up, and mm -hmm. you know, that was a, mm -hmm. a fairly noisy time. And then I've got the year end coming up the week after that. So I'll go soon after that. He says, no, I think, I mean, I'd like you to go like tonight, if I can. So then you start to think, well, maybe this is a little bit serious. Mm. So I went to London, and um, the diagnosis was a thing called acute myeloid leukemia, which is a, a rare form of blood cancer. You know, you, you, you're taking it very lightly here that, you know, you went through the chemo and all that stuff, but it must have been scary for you at some point. I mean, there was a point when you think, okay, so I might not come back. Uh, and then um, <laughs> you look at... Um, you look at the options because, you know, I'm, I'm one of the people who believe that when I die, actually I want to be cremated and pretty quickly. So that long drawn out process and uh, figured out that the average cost of a funeral in Britain is about $3,000, which is probably about four and a half, but whatever, in, in shillings. Yeah. Um, so I kind of figured that out and decided that uh, I really must get my affairs in order. Now, a colleague of mine, just before I was diagnosed, uh, Barak, Barak came to see me and he was diagnosed with stage four lymphoma. And, um, you know, being a CEO, I kind of give advice. And I said, okay, Barak, so I don't actually know anyone who's died of lymphoma, which is true, because Rose had lymphoma. And she, and she, she was fine. My yeah. sister had lymphatic cancer and she was fine. So I said to Barak, you'll be good, but make sure that you put your affairs in order knowing damn well that I didn't have my own affairs in order. So that was something which I had to do fairly quickly. But for sure, I mean, at some point, because yeah. it's, a, it's a terrible word. And everybody who's told that they've got cancer responds in a very different way. And, you know, my hematologist said to me, you know, how did you feel when you were first told? Yeah. I said, well, Panos, you know, I, psychologically, I'm probably a little bit deformed because I was, I was okay. You know, you've got leukemia, you've got leukemia. I said, what really upset me was when you guys told me two things. You, the first one is you said, it's going to take nine months. And I thought, are you crazy? You know, there's a company to be, to <laughs> be, be managed back home. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a family and stuff. Yeah. So that was the first thing which really upset me. Mm. And the second thing is when you told me that I'm, you know, I, post transplant, I would have uh, an extremely high chance of a relapse. Yeah. I said, I've kind of come to terms with that now. And you know, the science is really working pretty well. Uh, but being diagnosed with leukemia wasn't, I wasn't upset about it. I kind of, Somehow it kind of expected it. 
somehow I kind of expected it. Before we go on, folks, a bit of clarification. Mukis, Dr. Mukisa Kitui, Kenya's highest ranking uh, member of the United Nations, just sent a message saying, guys, don't forget me. <laughs> Peter, you'd like to comment on that real quick before you Dr. Kitui. Uh, Mukisa was an inductee. Yes. He never made it to the club. Right. <laughs> But once, twice, when he was around, I did ask Bob if he could come around, yes. and he came. There you go. And it was uh, th two, three times he came were worth the occasion. Absolutely. So, yes, he would feel the way he's feeling, yeah. but he was purely an inductee. Okay, you heard Bob there. Yes. This was 2017, right? Yeah, uh, when 2018. Was 2018. No, when he was just diagnosed, it was 2017, oh, right? October. Hmm. October 2017. Yes. And you were there, I mean, when he was going to Nairobi Hospital and I think Silverstein, Dr. Silverstein, and a whole bunch of doctors were, were telling him, this, this is serious. I think like he has said on that clip, he came back from Morocco feeling very tired. And that's when he sought medical attention at Nairobi Hospital. So just like Bob, he wouldn't tell you he's going in. Mm -hmm. so he just picks the phone and says, hey, I'm in your neighborhood. <laughs> because he knows where my office is. So I went to see him. And uh, in fact, I think the chairman got to meet me there after the chairman of uh, Safaricom also got to know just maybe the same time. And uh, from what Bob told me is that uh, Dr. Silverstein had given him kind of a reason that he needed to go and do further tests abroad. Like immediately? Almost immediately. Yeah. So, but uh, at, the po at that time, Dr. Silverstein didn't have the contacts in the UK. There is a doctor I had given, uh, whose contact I had given Bob. So I just told Bob, why don't you tell Dr. Silverstein to speak to Dr. Sandeep Patel in London Bridge Hospital, who is a cardio and a GP, but who then put Dr. Silverstein with the right connections. Uh, at the guy's hospital, right. where Bob spent quite some time. BT, uh, you guys, you all went to see him in London, right? All of you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All, all, all of you went, right? Yeah. I don't know why you're saying all of us. You are part of the discussions yes. as to how we'll each individually go. <laughs> so okay. we can be in this show, but you are the host. I am the host, but, but right. you are part of the discussions <laughs> that took place. You do not forget, yep. so you are part of the boys. Would you like some more water? <laughs> Don't change the subject. <laughs> but you went to see him in the UK, right? Yeah. yeah. More than once? Once. Yes. And? Was he in the bubble then? Was he in that bubble? No, I think, I think, I think, I think that was a stage when, you know, he was confident that, uh, you know, he hadn't yet done the transplant. And, um, and, and I think he was at a stage when he felt that he believed in it. And, you know, I think, uh, as we've said before, yeah. here's a man, he doesn't get defeated by anything. Mm -hmm. And he has this inner strength that he thinks he can basically um, overcome. Yeah. And uh, so I think he had that level of confidence at the time. So yeah, Josh, you also went to visit him. So I remember visiting him in December. It uh, was getting much colder in London at uh -huh. that time. And he had the audacity to even walk. Outside? Uh, we, yeah, we went outside. We went into a restaurant. And, I, and that was after the transplant. And we, had, uh, uh, we shared a meal with him. And one boy was there uh, over lunch. And then we actually walked back. Uh, so that, that's the kind of nature of practical ability that Bob actually had during his treatment when he was in London. Lamine, when you saw him? Yeah, I also saw him uh, in London. Um, again, that was the time when he had um, you know, done the transplant. Uh, he looked okay, uh, very optimistic that uh, this thing could actually work. I mean, it was a very tricky situation, but I think there was a sense of optimism that yeah. this could work. Yeah. Uh, for me, really what struck me was that, um, that strength of character inner strength of character that despite all of this, you know, challenge that he was facing, he was still calm, still gracious, uh, you know, still the Bob that we, that we all know. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's Bob. I'd like to discuss what happened this past weekend, just a little bit, because Josh, you got on a flight. Oh, oh wait a minute. Last Tuesday, first of all, last Tuesday. Remember, because uh, you guys were all at his place. I forced you to come. I'm about to get there. I'm about to get there. I was all the way at the uh, Empesa, Empesa Foundation, Foundation, remember? Yes. So it got to about 9 o'clock, I think 9, 9.30, and I sent you guys a message saying, guys, I'm not going to make it. Peter called me like 30 seconds later 
and he says, you'd better make it. Now I'm leaving exit 16A on the superhighway at 9.30. I got there about maybe 10.30, it was after dinner, right? Yes. You came after dinner. You right. came after dinner. And you guys were in a very somber mood. Take it from there. I think first, being a Tuesday and being a boys club meeting, we just expected the usual. Mm. That we'll go, have pleasantries, drinks, then sit down for dinner, then have one more round of drinks mm. and then head home. Mm. But you know, he, he welcomed us very well. On Tuesday, you couldn't see any sign. No. Whatsoever. No. Monica, you have some pictures you want to put up, right? right. Uh, yeah, go on. And uh, so we sat there very nicely. And then after about 40 minutes, you know, he dropped the bombshell. And he said, guys, I only have a couple of weeks, three to four. Did you understand that, BT? Did Nobody you, did you understood. understand that? No, I think he was, I mean, he, he said it nicely. He, he said, guys, you know, um, cancer, I've run out of options explained you know what happened and then we are kind of like you know kind of listening to him we turned on the mm. music that was playing mm. say you know what's this going on yeah. and he says um, you know that uh, um, you know I had option one two and now I've got no more options left and he says so I've got no options remaining and um, so we are kind of like you know we think probably he's going to say months maybe a year yeah, or so. Yeah, yeah. So we're saying kind of like, is it, no, months? He said, no. And no, BT kept on lowering and, and the volume of the radio because, because hear, yeah. he wasn't under. <laughs> so he wasn't clicking. He wasn't, he wasn't, yeah, was he was was in that state. Because, you know, Bob started, yeah. when, he, when Bob talks sometimes, he's become very soft. Yes. yes. So you really have to hear. Yes. And, he's, and he says, um, no, he said, guys, uh, he's very softly, he says, uh, we're talking about weeks. And then, like it was last Tuesday, so it's not even weeks, it was days. Josh, what did you think when he said that? So, so I'm, I wasn't able to make it on the Tuesday. You weren't there that day? So I only got information from PK I mean, I, I, and from Barra. That's Barrett. right. Were you out of town? So I had traveled on that day. Yes, uh, to, to New York. But I, but I remember, I remember that, uh, you know, this is very common for, so Bob didn't have a challenge about the words that he will speak. He will be very direct. He will say, guys, I have, what, a week, two weeks. It, it was as closer to that, and I haven't found somebody uh, very authentic even in difficult situations like Bob, to say, this is what I'm facing. And within the boys, it was as open, and the conversation was always open within yeah. the boys, yeah. in then, respect of the news. And then he's saying, guys, don't mourn. This is, I didn't call you to mourn, and then yeah. we opened up a bottle of a very special uh, director's blend, Johnny Walker, 138 bottles of 504, and we took pictures of it. And he says, we're going to cheer this. And like, you know, it's, it, we had it, it was difficult for us to kind of sit there. Yeah. This man is going to be dying soon. Yes. And, and he's, he's sitting opening. there saying, opening his best blend of whiskey. And he's saying, guys, you know, then, then somebody's asking, you know, and he's saying, oh, where am I going to go with this? I'm not going anywhere with this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, let, then, let and then that's the time that Peter, Peter, uh, Patrick Quarko, first time ever, he's having oh, whiskey. whiskey. He's never tasted whiskey, whiskey before, before. Right, right. <laughs> Even Bob took. By the way, when I arrived late, yes. you told me you have to drink this. Yes. And I said, I don't drink whiskey. I'm not a whiskey I drinker. I told you you, you said, have to. You have Everybody to had to. I mean, in the, you know, when you were leaving for Lagos, mm -hmm. and of course you interacted with Bob, did you think this thing would come this soon? Absolutely not. I mean, actually, I was confident that uh, you know, Bob had a good chance of, of making it. Mm. So when this week, actually, I picked the news that uh, it's looking rather bleak. Uh, I reached out to him on Saturday. So I called, unfortunately, he, he didn't pick. So I just dropped him a text mm. message saying that, you know, hang in there and, you know, we, you know we On Saturday? Out. On Saturday. On the Saturday. same day that we also the went late? The same day. Ah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I didn't make it, but uh, I, I did, uh, you know, send him a text message. So, yeah, it's, it's one of those uh, very tragic, uh, tragic moments. So about a month ago, he calls me. He says, what, what are you doing? I went over. Because I'm down the road. Yes. As, as is Joshua. Yes. And he told me, I may not make it past July. I said, what do you mean? He said, I, I, I may not make it past July. You know, this was the, the platelets time when we were, yes. we're all giving yeah, platelets yeah, yeah. and yes. stuff. Yes. And I said, what do you mean? He says, this thing is not working. It's not, I've run out of options. What you just said, mm -hmm. I've run out of options. You see what happened? When he did the stem cell and got the relapse, and I went to see him at Houston 
hospital at Houston, one of the biggest challenges was that the bad cells were walking along the good cells. So the good cells befriended the bad cells mm. and therefore the problem didn't come out. Mm. And as you know, his doctors were so super efficient, they picked it up very quickly. And he went through another round of chemo. But still, they went into some more what they call top up yeah. of the stem cell. Yeah. And then it went on until December when he had another relapse. So they gave him a different treatment in January, which seemed to work for three to four months. And then all this came out now. So by the time he was talking to you, yeah. I think the doctors had tried yeah, everything. everything. Mm. But I think credit to him, he understood it better than all of us. He prepared himself better than we thought, and he was ready to go through it. If you remember Tuesday, yeah. he kind of said, please don't grieve. Yeah. I am the one dying, not you guys. That was the, the position. And when the message went round through BT in that special WhatsApp group that was formed immediately mm. after Tuesday without Bob, mm. I could tell Joshua Correct. Was, was not, not getting unaware. was unaware. Mm. Yes. 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 So me. I picked up the phone and called uh, Josh and I said, Josh, this is, we this are on a touch and go. Mm. Mm. You better know this is where we are, but let's just all stay strong. But you know, Jeff, ultimately, you know, and Bob, by the way, what I call extraordinary courage. Right. I mean, he will take on many battles. This yeah. is very, very common. If you see him as a person, whether it's just his own personal life, uh, his own coming up as a young boy uh, in Kenya and, and, and even even in Kenya today. Mm -hmm. And he fought those battles to win. Yes. He only, so he was not a person who never gave up. No. I think, you know, the way we explained it at the uh, crematorium yesterday. Yes. Right? Uh, he had, like we said, he was a man with purpose. Purpose. I mean, he had planned his funeral. He said, I want to be cremated. There was a purpose. This is the way I need to do it. The whole death was planned. His, the way he was running his company, was with a purpose. I yeah. think this man came to this world with a purpose. And True. I think something that very few of us actually kind of think about it and say, what purpose do we have? I think this is one man that I think uh, we saluted for, for that sort of level of thinking. I mean, and and yeah. also that uh, uh, night, yeah. Tuesday. What is that we, cremation? That, uh, no, 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 that night. Oh, the, the, the when, dinner. When he told us what he had to tell yes. us. Pick you and I continued talking late night, trying to th see what we can do. Other alternatives. Other, other alternatives. Yeah. And uh, one was in Australia, one was in Germany. And I think we sent Bob some text messages and said, could we give your doctor this contact? And he said, he didn't respond. And I alluded to it on Saturday. Yes, I, sa I said, when I didn't see you respond, right. Right. I knew you were made up. He made up his mind. Yes. He was ready to go. Yes. I mean, yeah. he didn't want to go out of Kenya and then Again. something happened outside. 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 Yes. He preferred to be with his family yeah. <clears throat> in the house mm. for any eventuality. He was very focused and clear about that. I mean, mm -hmm. so the news breaks on Monday morning. The mm -hmm. entire country is in shock. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you to a person, what was it like in Lagos where you were? Same thing. I mean, uh, the few um, you know staff members who knew about uh, Bob uh, also you know come in, you know sort of uh, sympathized with me when they knew that you know I knew Bob. He was a good friend of mine. Um, so yeah, it was. This is world news, really. I mean, I think everybody really um, had the news and was devastated about about it. I think for me, Bob, it's not really um, how he died; it's how he lived. And uh, when we look back at his life at the extraordinary courage that he had, at the impact that he had on people that he met. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just uh, everybody that Bob met felt that there was a special relationship with him. Oh. He made people feel special, which is a very unique quality. And this is now across the board. So you're talking of somebody who deals with presidents, prime ministers, CEOs, right down to you know uh, the common one inch. So, and that quality of really reaching out Making people feel special is something that uh, you know we should all remember. Absolutely, that's a good I point. Think, I think if you yeah. look at his own organization, yeah. right, 
and I think people have been uh, writing, uh, you know, on social media, and how he would talk to the tea girl, how he would talk to yes. the reception, yeah. and I think it was it was the modesty that he showed, right, which was I think was a very rare um, trait today. A CEO of Kenya's biggest company, you know, doesn't have an inch of arrogance. Yeah. He'll talk to anybody and, 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 and everybody. And I think that was... There's a the lesson thing. in there somewhere, right? Of course. I mean, look, you, when you get success, success is not numbers. It's not the growth of the company that you get. It's the legacy that you leave behind. Yeah. And look at the amount of uh, praise that he's been seeing everywhere on social media from, yeah. from everybody. Oh, incredible. Because he's touched a lot of people in many, many ways. Absolutely. Gentlemen, I want to come back to that. We're, we're going to take a break, come back and talk about that side of Bob that many people didn't see. And by the way, if you, just, uh, if you don't know, tomorrow is the official memorial. It's going to happen at All Saints Cathedral beginning at 11 o'clock, thanks to uh, what will be conducted by Provost Right Reverend Canon Sammy Wainaina. Good guy. I met him tonight. Yes. Really good guy. And he says he'll be watching. So, Provost, I hope you're watching, and you'll be kind to us tomorrow. Well, you're the master of ceremony. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you mentioned that. Huh? So let's talk about that other side of Bob that very few people, we were privileged and honored to, 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 to find and, 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 to, and to be a part of. Very true. Right? And we're very, very privileged. I mean, I know many people knew him, many people thought they knew him, but you guys, us guys, we were close. We're going to take a break. Jeff Kuenanga Live. Keep tweeting at Kuenanga Jeff at Citizen TV Kenya. The hashtag is JK Live. JK Live is live with the Boys Club. And we'll be back in a moment.